I have to say, I mean, as we've mentioned, this was my first time making an album. Ross, you and I had recorded once, Shiver Lung 2, I think, also with Ryan. But this was the first time I was I was really doing a deep dive, and it was amazing, Nate, to have you there in the control room with us, just as somebody who's got such experience and such insight into these processes. I was actually a little skeptical about it, like walking in, and that has a little bit to do with how much I value liveness and that kind of the co-presence and that heightened human state of listening together with other people. But I was totally hypnotized once we started and, and really got addicted to the process. I'm really a composer who works with my hands and when I'm investigating sound, it's just, you know, it's three inches from my ear. I, I, it comes through my skin and through my arms. And, and so that's where I find the most satisfying detail. And with live performance, you know, even through amplification, I just can't give that amount of fidelity to the audience. Even though you get the charge of togetherness, you, you lose a lot of that detail. That many good microphones, you know, three inches from the cardboard box that Ross is digging into. And that's actually how I've always heard this music. It's how it came through me and how I wanted to put it out into the world. Um, and I can't quite do that in the concert hall and realize I really can in this in this studio context. Those were some really, really fun days in the studio. And I think, you know, Ash in particular has such a clear, she has a very clear notation language, but also a really, really clear idea of what it should sound like. And, you know, it, even with performers who really know her and know her music and know her language, there's, you know, there's never the perfect mark on the page to represent what's coming through the microphones and through the speakers. And so it was so important for her to be there, you know, and to be able to respond to what she was hearing and tweak things. And, you know, even to the you know point of me, you know, getting from her, you know, what was or wasn't coming through the microphones and then trying to move mic play. I mean, I remember very specifically with the Bode cardboard, with the Bode box, you know, playing around with the mic placement to try to get just the right balance of low frequency and squeak and you know that's all stuff I would never have had any concept of what was intended if she weren't there and so that's I mean that's those kinds of sessions are a blast for me frankly. the compositional process from my point of view doesn't necessarily and, and I think it's the same when we work together for you Ash in a certain sense I'll finish a piece in the studio and then it may mean that I want to add voices to it later or I want to do some other thing to slow down this part or drop it an octave. And having that amount of control, especially coming from the improvised world where I never have that amount of control, really feels magical. You know, there was a reason I was fascinated by tape music early on. It was like to be able to physically slow things down and change it, to take multiple takes, to really get into that fine-grained listening of overtones on this or maybe a little more pronounced um, is really special. And to do that as opposed to walking into a room and playing a concert, which is also really special, but this has a different kind of magic to me. And I really, I love being in the studio for that reason. I mean, I think for me, some of this is generational. I think I'm the tail end of a generation before you that grew up pretty deeply involved in the object. I mean, that was the, the trip to the record store was like the pilgrimage, monthly pilgrimage into Portland, um, coming back with LPs, coming back with CDs. There was an attachment to the object there that's slightly different. 
I think that's what makes the book special for me, actually, is it's a way of, of putting a hand out to people that may not know your work and say, like, here it is, not as a promotional tool, but as a way for us to have a conversation. Here's this thing I made. I want to give it to you in this loving way so that you can experience this because it's important to me. And we may never know each other. We may never have met or will meet. But this is, this is something for you. Something I, that also brought me a lot of satisfaction in this process is that you and Sound American really understood that it wasn't just going to be, you know, an off the shelf book. Like we put care and love into those pages and into their tactility and into their specificity and the images and where they are. And there's a lot of love poured into that object. And even though we're not going to get to meet everybody who ever holds one of those books, I think when they hold that, the materiality of it, the, the tactility of the of it, the way that those notions of the palpable and, and touch sensation then relate to, to the way people listen and the way maybe particularly music like mine really enters into the body. Um, I think that was a really beautiful link to explore and, and it and did kind of ground the, you know, the digital streamingness of the release. Like, and it's that the kind of ephemerality of that into this like beautiful distillation of like here also it's small, you know, it's precious, or it's not like overly precious and it being finicky, but it's like there's a delicacy to it. There's a there's a fragility. There's a um, there's an attention to detail in that book that I think really captures a lot of the spirit of the project too. You also attach memory to it, you know. So yes, there's the object now, but there will be that object twenty years from now when someone pulls it off their shelf. Maybe they're moving to a new apartment, and they it brings back emotions of when they received it and the first time listening and the first time looking through it or letting a friend borrow it. And that just lets all of the notions of what you're making kind of seep deeper into individuals' lives. I, I think that can be a really powerful thing. Being in conversation with Nate about this question of accessibility has been really interesting for me, actually. I've been very concerned with that concept, um, but have felt with these scored pieces and concert halls, it's like, if you fit in that sweet spot of an audience who feels like they can access either that room or that particular mode of listening, I think there's a lot to be discovered for you in that listening experience or in an engagement with a concert piece of mine. But these bigger works I find, like from across ages to across kind of backgrounds, um, there's a lot of ways I can invite people in. The way those projects aren't accessible is in their ephemerality, in the way that you have to be there um, in the flesh and in the skin to, to really to really be able to uh, take in what it has to offer. And so I think what you're talking about, the small kid, you know, the burgeoning weirdos out there and, and wanting to send sustenance to, to them sort of through the years and through the airways, is, that's inspiring to me, actually. And I think it's given me... Um, more motivation to take recording seriously and to think through the archive, not just in some kind of Western notion of importance and posterity, but really as an act of generosity. And so I think it sort of tuned my imagination toward thinking about different instantiations of a work. So if there is a live experience and there is a recorded experience, maybe they're not exactly identical, but both are really important and have something to kind of offer.
Hi, I'm Clifton Joey Gidry, and I made my album using Logic at the beginning of the pandemic in my mom's media room um, using one Audio Technica mic and a lot of stress. <laughs> um, and I reached out to some friends, especially Marat, um, who helped um, mix and master the whole album and sent it to many friends and got opinions and, yeah, received a lot of support. And that's how I made my album. I released it on Bandcamp. I did a pre-sale of the track Shut the Fuck Up and Listen, and that got a lot of really good traction a month ahead of the um, release. And my friend Ali and Olivia, they both helped me um, with marketing and social media and everything. So it was a very much a community effort of getting this baby out there. Basically, since I started engineering, you know, in the mid, early mid aughts, um, I've worked pretty much exclusively with a, what you could very broadly describe as art music uh, clients or artists, you know, and within that, it can range anything from a Baroque ensemble to really out contemporary jazz or new music and everything in between. For new music, I see a range of albums that are really led by a composer. And a lot of composers, the goal is just to get a accurate representation of their piece down. And the goal is kind of to make sure the notes and the rhythms are clean and everything's there. And it's, it's you know, a quality representation of their compositional intention. And so, you know, that kind of maybe leans more towards the archival documentary style uh, approach to a recording. We've definitely done a lot of projects that are artist or ensemble led where they've commissioned, you know, often it's obviously we're trying to spotlight what that artist, what that performer, what that ensemble wants to say about the repertoire and what they're doing with it. Um, and then, you know, I've also done projects which are, you know, great where it really is about doing something very specific with the sound of that record and with, you know, making it a thing that is unlike anything else, you know, whether it's something with the, the sound of it or some concept of how the album is sequenced and how the pieces kind of interact with each other across the, the duration of the record, um, you know, but really seeing it as a unique piece of art and not just a conduit through which you can experience this other thing, whether that's the composition or, you know, a live performance that you happen to be experiencing through a record. Um, and similarly, you know, I do a lot of jazz recording as well, and there's a similar kind of range of intentions there, whether it's more just about capturing a, one particular live performance that's improvisatory, or you're really trying to create a, a, a thing that is, will, will go on and, and have a life of its own that's maybe totally independent of that artist's performances, you know, live performance practice or, um, you know, any other things that might come out of, you know, a collaboration between the musicians that are involved. It varies a lot from project to project. And I've, you know, even with the same artists, I've worked on albums that have different roles in their career and in their artistic output. Ryan's setup at Otaven uh, with its beautiful Steinway is, is ideal for, for finding the possibilities of fine-tuning. It is just a safer space in a lot of ways, but also a, a different space qualitatively and creatively. We feel like we can try things uh, and fail if, if, uh, if that happens also, but just to have the freedom to experiment a little bit more, to refine things, and to get to the heart of what a composer once in, in our view and uh, to the essence of a collaboration. And because I'm also a producer, I know what can be possible in post-production uh, and how I, I can layer the elements of a recording and know how I'm going to assemble them in the end very roughly. So uh, having that analytic approach is, um, it, it's just, it's a good method of learning. Uh, it, it gets you more intimate and and more familiar with all the aspects of the piece, and so you know what you really want to show to an audience when you're uh, when you're opening it up to the public. I've learned I've learned so much from the process of making this album. I kind of wish I could do it again. I'll do it again with a different set of pieces. 
having played the pieces on my album in concerts for several years before I recorded them. Um, I was bringing them into the world, but in, in a more ephemeral way that someone would hear it in, um, in a concert and have that impression and then leave. And they, they remember liking that piece. I haven't achieved with recording yet the feeling of performance and that they're, they're very different feelings. I'm aiming to, to play exactly what's in the score but also to do something more than that. And if I do miss something, if there is a mistake, I actually kind of, I kind of like having, if, if it's not something too bad, I kind of like the idea that that is now in amber, that that's like encapsulated and it's more human, where I think that there is so much recording that we do that is just so not human and trying to be perfect and trying to be, just do exactly what's in the score and um, it's not, it's not possible. And I don't, as a musician, I don't want, I do want perfection, but I know that I'm not going to get it. And I know that I'm not going to play the same way in a recording session that I would on a concert stage. And, and so we shouldn't try to equate them. We should try to make them different experiences. I think I actually, from the very beginning of the commissioning project, thought that I would record at some point, but that was very um, nebulous and I, I didn't know when I when that would happen. And, and because I always had in my head that I had to do everything at once, um, I, sort, I, I didn't know at what point, like, as many pieces had come in as would make an album. Um, and I've, I've still, for, for over 10 years, been having discussions with different people about writing pieces for singing violist. And so, and I'm thinking, um, when do I start a second album? Well, I'm still pretty tired from making this one and I'm not sure yet how I wanna do that, but I think I would much rather have it be sort of a rolling experience. And um, if, I, if I have one a year from now, I will record that and it'll be there and sort of trusting as I did with with the first album um, that it would be um, a cohesive album not worrying about doing one by one and eventually I think it will all make sense. This different frame of listening for a recording versus going to a concert and, and uh, experiencing the, the ephemeral performance um, I, I think they can be reconciled in some way if if you capture some feeling of spontaneity in what you lay down on tape, uh, but also know that it's there to be uh, to be artistically messed with uh, if, if that's what you feel is appropriate, then uh, it, it can really be there in the moment when you're listening to a recording, no matter how far removed you are from uh, the actual session date. So it's, I think there's, there are bridges between the experiences. And probably, probably the best recordings are the ones that, that are able to capture that and have the spontaneity. Um, and I think I learned that from recording with the ensemble rather than recording by myself, like the ones where we're having fun. Um, I think, for example, Pulse, um, Steve Reich, that was, that was such a special piece when we performed it um, at Carnegie Hall. And then we had a performance uh, right like January 19th or 20th, 2017. That was a really difficult day. And I don't think it was as successful a performance because it was such a joyful piece and hard to play. But then when we came back and recorded it and without a conductor, which we had done with, with two different great conductors two different times, but playing it as a chamber ensemble piece and coming back. And I think we were seated in a circle um, for the recording and it, it just felt that was one of the, the most, like where we did reconcile the perfection of recording and the joy of performing. George Lewis's recording was especially interesting because we were including live recordings and studio recordings, and we we wanted to to, to highlight uh, the excitement of a live performance while making a uniform audio standard. 
Uh, and, and also just using everything at our disposal to make each performance the best that it could be. So uh, there was some internal editing that we used for the live performances on there. Uh, and we also got George in the studio to record a trombone piece. So it's, um, you know, if every project is, is different, but you, you, you want to go as deeply into the style and the requirements of the style. And to have the composer on hand is extremely important for that. I think just knowing what the, the end stylistic goal is and knowing generally what you want the dramatic and musical experience of listening to be, you can make appropriate decisions. I, I feel so comfortable at Octava now. I see the books on the wall. I see the, the particular microphones that always make me smile. I see Ryan in the booth and I, I just feel at home where in, this, in the past year, I actually am at home <laughs> and doing recordings with my husband. And yet there's, there's just such a different thing. It's, it's elevated to be at Octavin and to be in that environment. It's just, it's beautiful. It's, um, there's, something, um, there's something intangible about it. I recorded my second album, Metafogoche, in 2015 and released it in 2016. All sessions were recorded at Octavan Audio with Ryan Streber, session producing, editing, mixing, and mastering. Jacob Greenberg provided extra post-production support. The album was released as a digital only release, making a few press copies as CDs. This made it harder than I had originally anticipated to get a lot of promotion, but mostly I did grassroots reach outs and social media for promotion of the album. Metafogoche was released on Tundra, which is the small independent record label, which is an offshoot of New Focus Records run by Dan LaPelle, and Tundra is run by International Contemporary Ensemble. I kind of gather all my friends, like my instruments together and think, which sounds do I want in this world? And how open is this world or how close to the speaker is it? And based on that, I gather either my microcorp or my TR-707 or chaos pad and my pedal board and figure out exactly how they're all going to talk to each other and how they're going to relate to each other. I usually work in uh, Logic as a DAW. Um, because I kind of just needed a place to house the effects that I'm externally doing. Uh, so I don't really need Macs or anything like that. Um, and then I just start putting them together based on a vaguely succinct feeling, you know, maybe this feeling of, I think this is about loss. How can I follow through with that? And then over the course of working on it, I'll figure out, well, this isn't really about loss of a loved one. This is kind of about loss of a past version of myself. Um, and really commit to the nuances of that and think about how I can succinctly say that in a lyric, what words precisely represent that. And then I'll start singing things that seem to fit and not bother what's happening in the music. So that in the end, it's a collaboration between my instruments, my friends and myself, but only myself in this present tense, but like myself in a past version as well. Thinking if I were him before, what would he think of me now? And if I were me later, um, what would I think of me now trying to speak about him back then? So it gets kind of messy and all over the place, but the thing that helps really focus it down is using logic um, and just putting all these things right next to each other and helping them build each other up and flush each other out. I, uh, I kind of just put things out on Bandcamp right now, like put them onto the internet, send them to my friends and just let it do whatever it's going to do, um, which recently has been they go further and further, which is more shocking. Um, but I, I kind of intentionally haven't put things on Spotify yet just because I get the feeling that when I do, I want to make sure that I know exactly how I'm presenting things to people uh, before I put it on such a massive platform. So I think I like for now that it's it's in a place that's public and all my music's free. It's just uh, 
kind of in like a loosely kept secret place <laughs> that if you wanted to dig and find, you could totally find it and it's linked to everywhere, but it's not Spotify. It's not going to just come to you. The title Palabras means words, but also for me, it means to have your voice heard. Palabras en alto means to raise your voice, to say something, to say something meaningful. That kind of meaning is also imprinted in the music. You know, there are, there are places where actually Wendy has to, you know, to scream, you know, stuff like that, right? And do these kind of uh, crescendos to a high point. And that has to do with, you know, say something. But when you say something, say it with, with your soul, right? And then like, do you really mean it? And so everyone can hear it and say something meaningful. What you say about the, the title is such a metaphor for make, creating anything. And and the poem is um, is about the struggle of creating something. And of I think I, I read it as um, the poet not necessarily having control over the words that are coming out, but trying to control them and corral them. And, um, oh, these awful things like that I need to put all together and finally I get them in one place. But, and the, the feeling of the, the piece also of playing the piece is that there are so many intricate details and so many things for both viola and voice that part of it each time is the process of putting that together. Um, that it's in practice, it's kind of different each time and it's it's tenuous, but trying to make something cohesive out of it and out of all of these words or notes or whatever any artist decides to use as as the um, the means for creation. That as as we're trying to control all of these seemingly uncontrollable things, um, somehow you end up with something on the other side that that makes sense and works. What called my attention of, of the text is that the phonetic of the word, you know, the, of, of the words, uh, the, the, the consonants, the, 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 their vibration, their color, their attack. And most of the piece is about this interaction between the, vo the voice and the instrument becoming one third instrument, a third instrument that doesn't exist. And they're always trying to converse. They're always not only trying to dialogue but they, they're trying to fuse you know to become one it's about words but whose words is it my my words your words it's not one single thing so the words at the end do not mean anything or it can mean many things
Croiset. Thank <laughs> you.